So we have abundant water in the state, but there are instances where we have not had enough. These circumstances uh, motivated the state to become interested in developing these in-stream flow and water level rules. And we've been doing this since 1984. Um, the discussions have come up. How does uh, water, how does waters of the state get allocated? Who gets what water, when, and by which means? As you can imagine, one of the truisms of public policy is um, you don't start uh, implementing things until there's a crisis. So things started heating up um, uh, quite seriously when we saw some actual drought conditions. Um, some ponds were completely dewatered. Uh, fish uh, did die. So when the Atlantic salmon was listed, the question of how much water do you need to maintain aquatic habitat was brought forward in a policy on the table. The legislature um, came in and said, all right, there's uh, some laws that we're going to enact. And they really set out um, a policy framework for the agencies to implement. And it was really two parts. Um, first in 02 um, was the water withdrawal reporting program. But who's taking what water from where, when, and how much, we don't know. So a law was enacted that said if you take a certain amount of water um, on a daily basis, or, jeez, uh, I have to look it up every time. If you take a certain amount of water out of particular water sheds, you need to report that to the state. And what the state agencies will start doing is gathering this information and finding how much water is used, both surface and groundwater, in particular watersheds. And we'll start thinking, scratching our heads, and say, yep, we got a problem. Nope, we don't have a problem. Um, along with that water withdrawal reporting um, framework was a, a legislative mandate to the agencies, with Department of Environmental Protection being in the lead. And they said, we want you to go forward and develop a rule that will be based on all this data that we are providing to you and bring it back to us. That was in 2002. And the rule was just enacted in 2007. We decided that it's important to have a rule because if we set this rule up right, we will establish a planning framework so that we can begin to anticipate allocation and conflict. Um, this is a very, very forward-thinking legislative charter. Um, this was modeled um, along some other New England state laws. Connecticut was having the same debate at the um, time that the legislature was enacting this law. Um, and what the legislature said was, we want you to put this rule together, but you have to consider the natural variation of rivers, streams, and lakes. That's a pretty tough mandate because what you're doing is asserting in the first place that streams, by their very nature, fluctuate. You can take water away from that fluctuation, but only to the point that the bugs and the fish and the plants aren't adversely affected. And lastly, the, uh, the rule framework sought to have a planning framework put around it by saying what you have to do is give us criteria after you write this rule that tells us when a particular watershed is going to be at risk from competing uses. What's missing from this rule? There is no allocation in this rule. The only thing this, thing do this rule does is says here's how much water has to be in that river, stream, or brook, or in that lake when the top user takes water and the bottom user says there's not enough flow past my gauge or my stage, what happened to my water? doesn't deal with allocation at all. Okay, let's talk about the water classification standards. Um, when the, uh, the Clean Water Act and Maine law was enacted, it said you have to zone your waters. It says you have double A waters, A waters, B and C, for flowing waters, and then we have one classification for lakes, GPA, Great Pond A. This classification framework has actually changed over time, and if you go back into the, uh, the water law in the 1950s, because Maine actually had uh, water quality laws before the Clean Water Act, there was Class D and Class E rivers. This was enacted in 1986. What I want you to take home is, let's take a look at AA. This is the most recent change to our river and stream classification. When you have a double-A water, it has to be free-flowing and natural. It can't be impounded. Um, GPA, lakes here have to be as naturally occurs, and a lake cannot have a declining uh, trophic state. So if you see a lake over time that's trophic state, measured by Secchi disk, is declining, it's not meeting its standards. But these are the, uh, the big-ticket goals, and this in-stream flow and water level rules fits 
right inside this classification framework. So if you're pulling water from a double A, you have a different standard than if you're pulling water from a C. And actually that gets right into the question of these in-stream flow rules. Are we allowing too much, not enough water to be taken out so that in these segments all aquatic species are protected? I don't know, 20 years from now we may find out we didn't do it right. Let's keep it simple as we can. Um, these rules ended up being, I think, seven pages, which is a reasonable test. Um, you have to have reasonable use of all waters. The legislature was pretty clear about this. They didn't want agriculture kicked out of any of the waters. Water districts, they are legitimate uses. The legislature provided charters to them. Uh, don't be messing with them. Um, it has to recognize existing flow and level agreements. There's a lot of different mechanisms out there, whether it's a FERC hydro license, a state water level order, some other informal um, agreement that's been established for <coughs> flow or water levels. It has to recognize those. It has to encourage planning and conservation. Um, and a subset of that is it needs to encourage storage. Um, and by that, you'll see this rule, in one respect, forces storage for agricultural users because they're not going to be able to take it directly from the stream. But the rule has to allow for creation of storage infrastructure to be developed as it is implemented. So we've worked very closely with the Department of Agriculture to put money into uh, storage structures and also provide a regulatory framework for compliance for farmers. Who doesn't it apply to? Um, it doesn't apply to tidal waters. Um, it doesn't apply to a storage pond. So if you build a pond in your field and you fill it up with water, we're not gonna then say, oh, you only get a certain amount of water out of that pond, you just build it. The flow in the stream passing a point. So there's someone standing on Old Stream in Wesley, and they stood on that spot for a year. The volume of water that passed by them is measured on this chart, all right? So in December, there was approximately 100, uh, two, 300 cubic feet per second moving by that person. When you went down to September, down here, there was about two cubic feet per second moving past that person, all right? So this is called a hydrograph. It is the, um, the flow of water moving past a point in a watershed. This rule says, there are six seasons in the life of a river and a stream that are important. If we look here in the spring, February 15th to April 15th is springtime. Early winter is October 15th to December 15th. What we recognize is that a spring flow needs to be higher than a summer flow, and that higher flow in the spring just isn't a higher flow. It's actually scouring the stream bottom, creating habitat for plants, encouraging migration and affecting structure and community for the macroinvertebrate populations. That high flow is doing stuff. It just doesn't happen to be moving past the stream. Similarly, in early, in early winter, you need to have enough water so that you don't um, completely freeze the stream for the critters that are used to overwintering and um, breeding over the winter there. See that natural variation is the black line? The pink line is the rules mimicking of natural variation of flow. The median flow over some historical period of time represents the threshold for this stream averaged over these six windows. Local conditions are important and there are site-specific formulas that take into consideration your watershed so that you can calculate your seasonal medians. That represents about six years worth of work. Um, by the U.S. Geological Survey, about $100,000. You only have, you only get a portion, you skim a little bit off the peak flows, and only when the peak flows are high enough. If it was a double A, you'd get all this water. If it was a single A or a B or C, you'd get all of this water. And what we did is show farmers that if you translate this red blob into a volume of water, it's going to fill your pond up. Tell us how big a pond you need, they tell us. We run these calculations and say, you can fill that pond up in March, have that pond in your field, and when the summertime comes around, you'll have plenty of water to irrigate your crops because you shaved it off the top of the stream in the spring. In the summertime, July, August, September, 50% of the time, you're not going to be able to take water. 
So the administration, uh, the King administration put money into ag irrigation ponds, um, and the Baldacci administration every year has put money into this. There's about 18 um, farmers in the state that don't have storage that are affected by these rules. So actually that's a, a conscious strategy for water districts. Um, it's called an interceptor well. They'll place groundwater wells um, and use the distance between the surface water source and the well to filter their water. Um, there is a clause in the rule that says if the well is impacting surface water, it can be brought in and considered, but otherwise there is no connection. And again, that's the disconnect between groundwater and surface water. Groundwater is private property, so you can use it um, within certain circumscribed limits um, your, uh, your own free will. But in general, we recognize existing permits now. Sugarloaf has had a, a level limit in its permit for a long time. 